What's up, Eagles? <laughs> What's up, Cerebral Football fans? My name is Steven Heider. This is Gay City Sports Channel. All right, guys, so we're continuing on kind of evaluating the draft value around pick 22. The players we've heard linked to Philadelphia and just kind of like what their tape, what the background is on the players. And it brings us to Latu and today's topic, which is a complex one because the film on this guy is quite impressive. This guy is the absolutely the most polished pass rusher coming out of this draft class. And he's up there in terms of the last three or four draft classes. However, you don't get those type of attributes being named beside you without a major but. And that major but is the fuse neck that we all kind of learned about with this player who kind of at one point could not get medically cleared, moved on to another university, was diagnosed by an NFL doctor who then cleared him, and then he continued to play at UCLA. And I'll be honest with you guys, his tape at UCLA – is quite impressive. This young man is a really, really good football player. There's absolutely a big risk here with the potential of a big reward. And I think it just depends upon your perspective when you're picking in the 20s because that's that's really the difficulty, right? It's like if you're in the top half of the draft, I think you can make some reasonable, you know, kind of, you know, hold the phone here kind of comments about taking a player that high up. But when you're in the 20s, yeah, I mean, there's going to be injury risk with a player like this, but there's also going to be risk of just completely having a bust drafted as well. I mean, if you're going to miss on prospects, you're going to miss on the back half of the first round, right? Because there's a lot at play when you're trying to draft guys in the back half of the first round. That board is complicated because on one hand, you know, you're trying to draft, you're trying to do everything you can to not have to draft by need per se, in terms of immediate needs. We're talking about long-term needs, being able to get that best player available at a long-term need. But also when you're dealing with the first round, because there's that fifth year option, you have to make sure that the positional value lines up the way you like to structure contracts and, and what you can see with this player. And that's why I think you get a lot of misses when you get to that back half of the first round, to be quite honest. Uh, with that said, it's a weird story with Howie, right? I mean, Howie's been definitely hit or miss in the back end of the first round. I mean, you know, we definitely had guys like, you know, Marcus Smith. You know, we had Danny Watkins, you know, Andre Dillard, Jalen Rager. You know, we definitely had those misses, but we also had in the second round, the Miles Sanders, right? We've had the, you know, the Dallas Goddard's in the second round. Like we've, it's, it's been a weird kind of back and forth, like kind of weird, you know, way of, you know, Jalen Hurts was a second rounder. Like it's been a weird dichotomy to where you have the same grouping of players. Like they all kind of fall together in this grouping, but we've been way more successful in the second round than we have in the first round. And I do think some of that has to do with contract structure and how you value the positions. So I think if you get a rare chance in the 20s at a guy that may be a medical risk, I think I'd probably bank on the medical risk over just, hey, man, like we need this particular position of value. Like we're not going to draft the safety in the first round because we don't value the, you know, the fifth year option. Guys, I'm making that narrative up. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just, you know, I'm making the narrative up to so we can discuss this basically. But you get what I'm saying? Like, you know, we're not going to draft a slot wide receiver in the first round because we don't value a fifth year option on a slot receiver. I mean, Nelson Aguilar, but different story, right? All those things are kind of true, right? It's where you have to pay attention to that board. So I do think a guy like this, medical risk, back half of the first round, I think, you you know, you bank on, okay, what is our medical team telling us? Are they saying that they're giving this guy a clean bill of health? He's going to be okay. It's paid off with dudes like Josh Sweat. It's paid off with dudes like Landon Dickerson. It's burnt us on the Sidney Joneses. <laughs> like, you know, it burnt us when we didn't draft DK Metcalf. This is a tough one. This is a tough one because this prospect is very good. And I'm going to get into what I saw on the tape from this young man. I got some examples pulled up I'll share with you tonight. The first thing I noticed about this young man is you can tell from the way I titled this, guys, that I, you know, I'm, I'm making a statement here, which is this is a poor man, Sean Merriman. Now I want to add this. I want, I want to add clarity to this. I want to add some context, if you will. When I say a poor man, Sean Merriman, Sean Merriman had a little bit more link to his frame, okay? He was a little bit longer in the arms, all that kind of stuff, right? A little bit more athletically gifted, 40-inch vertical, ran similar 40 times, had similar, you know, this guy's a little bit more twitchy in terms of the 10 split. Um, Merriman was slightly bigger, but they're both well-sized for what the role is. But that's the thing is I'm talking about the way that this young man bends the edge and then flattens. There, there are some elements to his game that screams out Sean Merriman, the way he bends and flattens the edge, the way he plays with power, speed to power. It's very Sean Merriman-esque. I'm calling him a poor man Sean Merriman because I think it's disrespectful to outright claim that a dude with major injury concerns who hasn't set, you know, a sing, he hasn't played a single down of professional football is Sean Merriman. So I'm going to call him a poor man Sean Merriman right now. 
also Sean Merriman was a, like, you know, he was like a top 12 pick. I mean, you got to give the guy a little bit of credit for what he was as a football player. All right. I want to jump into the tape. I want to talk a little bit about what is on the film for this guy. So without further ado, guys, let's go ahead. Let's jump into a couple examples of what the film shows with this young man and just kind of like what I was picking up on because this dude's a player, man. This guy can really, really play. So let me go ahead and go to video files. All right, I'm going to pull up my desktop, and we're going to do the lot two breakdown. Listen, the very first play that pops up here is going to be me showing you him in coverage, okay? So this is going to be a, a coverage play. All right, bending the edge and flattening out. All right, watch him over here. Look at this. Bends, flattens, boom. Uh, Grayson McCall is going to NC State. Hopefully he's going to have a better line. He nearly had an entire freaking, you know, highlight reel off of uh, this Coastal Carolina game because of how bad they were. Now he's top screen. Bends the edge, flattens again. Speed to power. Now they got him lined up on a tight end, over a tight end. Uh, this is just a complete mismatch. Watch the bottom of the screen. Here he goes, bends the corner, flattens, uh, it's all over. All right, inside pass rush. Watch his hand placement here, okay? I'm going to show they, they circle him out here. Okay, I want you to watch the outside hand, the outside hand. Watch him come over with that overarm club move. Watch that outside hand. Okay, here it goes, boom, he's through. This guy's hands placement, hand usage, just, it's top notch, guys. This is one of the best, most impressive things I've seen. This guy's a very impressive toolbox for a pass rusher. Like, I, I was... Pleasantly uh, surprised at how much I liked his film, man. Um, he's he's man, he's a player. This guy's really really good. Sorry if, if it's getting twitchy, guys. It looks like the internet's a little iffy tonight. But um, yeah, I mean, look, he's a ball player, man. This is a guy that that's going to have some moments to where if you go watch his film, it's not hard to see why a bunch of teams are really really impressed with this young man. He can play. Like he's he's a ball player, guys. I mean. It sucks because there's injury concerns with this guy. But, I mean, when you watch the film, this guy is the most complete toolbox out of any pass rusher. I love Jared Verse from Florida State. I think he's going to be a really good player in the league as well. I think he's a, a very good all-around player, right? He's a decent pass rusher. He's got some upside as a pass rusher. Really tremendous run defender. Good athlete, right? Uh, Alabama's Dallas. Athletic, speedy. I don't think he's that top tier guy he's being placed out to be, but I, you know, I, I do see why some people might be drawn to him because if he ever puts it together, the type of athleticism he has is really hard to duplicate. You know, you look at chop Robinson, another really, really raw athlete, really, really good player, you know, in terms of the athletic profile has a long way to go guys, you know, in terms of the development. When I look at Latu, I got no doubts what this guy is. This guy is ready. This dude is NFL ready. He has a toolbox that could, he could step right in. And as a rookie and be a third pass rusher and be quite effective as a third, fourth guy. Like if you're, if you're doing line rotations, right. And you're using this line rotation, right. The Eagles are just going to keep switching these guys in and out, whatever line rotation you put this guy on. I feel like you could be dependent upon like this young man can be very much dependent upon. He's very good. He's a little short on the arm length. I think he's like 32.75. He's under that 33 and a half or so. But I mean, to be honest, he's so strong with the way he uses his hands. It hasn't been an issue. Yeah, he's 32.63 inches in arm length, 79-inch uh, wingspan. So he's got the wingspan, guys. I mean, he's almost got an 80-inch wingspan as an edge. Like, he's got the wingspan, a little shorter in the arms, but it, it doesn't show up on film, guys. And that's all I look for is like, okay, show me this young man versus the run because that's where you'd have some concerns of him getting reached to because of the shorter, you know, length there. But as long as he's staying disciplined, number one, you have to understand the way that Vic Fangio plays his run gaps. And like, those inside guys – he's going to play some more traditional bodies from 280 some pound plus guys in there in, in four I technique. Okay. Four I is an edge position, but it's very much meant up to, to be difficult to defend versus run. It, you know, it makes it really difficult for those guys to reach you in the run game. Outside of that, you'll see them use some of the interior defensive linemen in other, you know, very specific ways of doing things like Jimmy, which is where you two gap the five technique, or you can do pony, which is where you two cap, two gap to three technique and the five technique. So that way it keeps those outside rushers upright. And their job is really just kind of, they're waiting for the players to basically get spilled out to them. The whole point of that is to spill the ball outside. And uh, I, I think that this guy, I think a lot of the, you know, we hear question marks about a lot of these guys. We'll have to see it on Sundays, but I do think that the way that Vic Fangio plays his run fits, I think some people are, are, are maybe getting a little too worked up about that. I don't think it's going to be quite the same. It's all in the same realm, 
but it's not exactly apples for apples with the way Jonathan Gannon did things, nor is it the same way that Desai did things. Both of those guys drew inspiration from Vic Fangio, but they didn't use everything exactly the way that Vic Fangio does. So that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing, man. Like it's, it's going to be one of those situations to where if I'm sitting in the twenties, we all know the injury risk, but he got cleared by a medical professional that works with NFL organizations to play. And he came out and played quite well. He's the best pass rusher in this class. Hands down. He is the absolute best pass rusher in this class. His toolbox is the deepest. He comes with the most strength from that, that speed, the power. He's absolutely one of the best there. This young man can bend and flatten the edge, unlike any other prospect I've seen in this draft class so far. Uh, the other kid I like a lot, and, and we'll get to him as we kind of discuss more of the day two and, and day three options, but I do like Neyland, who they brought in for a couple of visits as well. I think he's another really well put together in terms of the prospect. I think he's really decent at defending the run. I think he can give you a pass rush, but none of these guys are perfect, right? We're dealing with Latu, who's a really high prospect, but because of the injury, we're talking back half of the first round. And then when you talk about Neyland, be- dominant, played really well, I'm telling you, he's he'd be pretty dang high on my board for for you know an edge player, an, an edge rusher. But with that said, quality of competition is going to be the concern with this with that young man. So like, there are a couple guys in this class that I like a lot. But you got to be careful. You got to be real careful the way you play. There's also the kid out of Colorado State. Uh, I believe it's Muhammad. He's another young man that has some really impressive film behind him. He's got a lot of the um, intangibles, the size profile things that you look for. There's a couple of really good prospects, but none of them are allowed to. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. None of them are, are quite as polished as Latu is. I mean, this, this young man, he's ready to play. Now, I'll run that film for you guys one more time because I know some of you guys are just coming in. So for some of y'all that are just coming in, we'll run the film again for you so you can just kind of pick up what I was catching on the film from this young man because uh, I can be honest, guys, once I saw his film, I my, my viewpoint started to change. I get why there's a lot of interest here in this young man. So Latu's breakdown, here we go. This is him in coverage. Watch him play back out. Boom, gets his hands back up. There you go. He's not dropping in the flats there but we're just judging the hips here, right? He's going to bend the edge and flatten out. It's going to be on the bottom of your screen, guys, when it comes up. Here you go. Watch. Bend, flatten. Grayson McCollum is about to be uh, NC State's quarterback. Grayson McCall, he's, he's eating it. All right, look to the top side this time. He's going to bend, and he's going to flatten. Look at him engage with the hands. Boom. Flattens out. Here's Grayson McCall down again. Don't worry, man. We got you at NC State. We got better line. They put him on a tight end. This is comical. Trying to put this guy on a, on a tight end. Watch this. Watch this. Boop. Here he goes. Flattening out. Bam, it's all over. I, it's just ridiculous what this guy's going to do. Inside pass rush this is the thing that really drew me into him. All right, so we're going to judge his hand usage here. Okay, they're going to show you. Watch the outside hand do that overarm club movement. Watch that outside hand come over top. Here he goes. What? Boom, he's free. His toolbox, man. His toolbox is above everybody else's, guys. I'm not lying. This, man, this young man's toolbox is above anybody else in this draft class. It's not even close. It's not even close, guys. I wouldn't even bring this young man up with the injury concern unless the film looked like what I'm seeing. And this is the hard part because you are dealing with a pretty serious concern with the injury. But at the talent level is a certain point, man, the, the rate of misses in the 20s is so high. I'd rather miss on a dude because of the injury than miss on a dude because I completely mis-evaluated the player, you know, Marcus Smith, where that evaluation was just wrong. I, I don't know, guys. I, I'm a fan of this guy. I'm a fan of him. I mean, I think he's a really good football player. Uh, guys, hang on. Give me a minute. I see some of y'all asking me his age. I don't know offhand. Let me let me look it up for you real quick. Um, late two. Sorry, guys. His, uh, his first name is uh, it's difficult to say. I'm not even trying. <laughs> if they didn't say it in the videos I watched, I'm not even trying that one because this is going to get insulting. He's 23 years old, guys. He's 23 years old. Let me see when he was exactly born. December 31st, 2000. So he'll be 24 at the very end of the season. So still a fairly young prospect, right? He's not the youngest of the guys out there, but he's very young. The rate of missing in the 20s, guys, is really high. We talked about that at the beginning of this stream because you're trying to align positional value to the fifth year. And whether or not you want that or not, that's why I think how he's so good in the second round and has been so bad in the 20s at drafting. So when you get a guy like this, who, and believe me, guys, Byron Murphy the second is on my board too. Okay. Latu's on my board. Byron Murphy the second's on my boy, board. Kool Aid McKinstry's on my board. Uh, the young man, Cooper uh, Dijon, he's on my board. You know, I had the, um, uh, what's his name, guys? The um, tackle guard prospect that uh, um, 
Troy F- Fontano, Fontano. He's on my board. There's, there's, my board's a little limited because like you have to trade up. You're going to get them. I would love to get a Jared verse. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think we're going to be in range, but if he came down past pick 16, I'd be in on a Jared verse. I think that you got to judge what Howie will take. Um, there's a couple of other prospects that I do think deserve some, some mention just in case like JC Latham, JC Latham. I do think you have to kind of put him on that board because you know that he could potentially play right guard and you could kick him out to right tackle. Um, Fashanu, how do you say his name, guys? The, the young man from Penn State. I'm not. I'm not a Penn State guy, guys. I'm, I'm an NC State guy. Um, he's another guy I've heard linked to the Eagles, and, and you know has a lot of those same attributes. So there's there's some players like that. Nate Wiggins will be an interesting one because I don't think he's a great scheme fit for the Eagles, but I do think that you know despite his lack of size, he's a good player. He's one of the better players in this draft class. Um, I'll tell you another guy that I don't think will be on the board just given the, the nature of the contracts right now that just came out, but at the same time, if the Eagles ended up trading backwards and ended up landing this player, or even if they took him where they were standing, I wouldn't be completely shocked, is wide receiver Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU. I'm a, I'm a fan of taking receiver more in day two, second or third round if you trade back from 53 and get into the third round. I'm, I'm more of a fan of of that mode of doing things, guys. I, I don't, I don't want to take another first-round pick there just because I think there's too much we have to address on other positions. Not that receiver's not a concern because – You know, we got AJ theoretically locked up. I will say there's no guaranteed money in 25, so they have to do something there. But Xavier, uh, Xavier Leggett, the young man from South Carolina. Oh boy, that's a that guy's gonna be pretty good, I think, in the league. Big physical receiver. He's a guy that can play the slot. By the way, he does play some slot. He can play outside. I said in the thing, everyone kept asking me like, "Hey, Gabe, do you think that he's a um, an AJ Brown type? Do you think he's a Debo Samuel type? Do you think he's an Anquan Bolden type?" I was like, look, I'm not saying none of those comparisons are necessarily bad. I think he's closer to AJ than the other two guys. But I'll say this, none. there's no perfect comp for him because he's such an athlete that you don't see that size. It's rare to get that kind. He's like a kind of like they, everyone got oohed and odd over Traylon Burks, but I think he's more polished than Traylon Burks as a route runner. Um, I see a little Musin to him. Musin Muhammad, the former Carolina Panther. I know Masin Muhammad had a little bit bigger of a frame, longer arms, that kind of thing, longer wingspan. But if you just watch the way he plays the ball on that sideline, the way he can contort and get his body up and frame you out, like basically box out dudes in the air and catch the ball, it's very Masin Muhammad-like to me. That's the guy that kind of, it kind of reminded me of. Masin Muhammad, also a very physical player. I know some of you guys are probably like, hey, who are you talking about, bro? <laughs> like <laughs> Old school guy. Old school Carolina Panther. We're talking about the 90s, early 2000s there. Some of my, uh, my older... Gentlemen in this chat and, and uh, my older, uh, you know, women in this chat will remember him a little bit. Uh, very physical, very consistent player in the league. He was a really good player, man. Uh, JT, bro, these Polynesian names is tough, bro. <laughs> it's, they're tough, man. <laughs> yeah, Masin, Moose. Moose, bro, that's, that's who he reminds me of. That's, that's who I'm reminded of when I watch that young man's film. I think he's going to be really good. I think if you can get back in that range of the second and third round, you know, you could trade out of the second if you want to acquire more picks and then kind of move down to the third round. If there's, there's got to be two to party there, you know, two to tangle, if you will, that you need another party be interested in a trade. But if one of those quarterbacks roll down the boards in the second round and somebody wants to come up and get one of those quarterbacks, we got two second round picks. I would probably slide down into the third round and acquire more picks if I was the Eagles, especially if I can stay somewhat in the early third round, the early to mid third round, I'd probably stay there because I do think that there are a few names at the wide receiver position that will be available in that range that could give you, you know, that's where I would look for receivers personally, guys. But as I'm building my board, there's a few names that kind of stand out to me to where I'm like, okay, these are the type of names I would go after. Just a positional, the positional value. You know what I mean? Like offensive line, defensive line. We know the way how he likes to build that. We know the way how he likes to use those players. Um, I think corner is a place they haven't gone recently but they have targeted players. I had someone that commented and was like, they're just not going to go cornerback. Why do we waste our times on first round picks? Because they have attempted to go cornerback in that span since Lito Shepard. They've attempted it. They just haven't been in position to make the pick. Guys, before they drafted Devontae Smith, would turn out to be an incredible plan B. He was not the original target, guys. That's not who they wanted. They wanted Patrick Sertain. Denver took, they had the back-to-back drafts where they had, you know, at eight, you know, you had, uh, I think it was Horn came off the board, then nine, Sertain come off the board. And then when both of those players came off the board, the Eagles and the Cowboys basically lost interest. So then you basically had Dallas make the trade with Philly. They moved back, got Parsons. We moved up, 
jumped the Giants, and then we took, you know, Devontae Smith. I think people forget that narrative. That, that that's where the Eagles were going to go. So like I, I kind of refute what they're saying a little bit. Like, no, like if the right player is there, it's no different from receiver. You're trying to control the contracts. These cornerback contracts are creeping up over $18 million for these top level players. It's about 18 a year or so. That's that's the line for like really good corners now. Like, you know, you're, you're going to pay a little bit for these cornerbacks. So I think that's an area where they're going to want to control that fifth year option. I do think cornerback is in play. Safety, I don't know, man. I haven't made my, my mind up yet. I still think safety, they're still looking like kind of like tight ends. I think they look at that as like a day two valuation type thing, second, third round thing. I, I think that's where they, they view those positions. But we'll see. I mean, you know, running back, we were for the longest time, but then they, they went after CMC. It just depends on the apple of the eye, right? I mean, that's, that's part of the, the situation. All right, guys, let's get into some comments. What's up, Hort Dog? He says, Latu reminds me of Phillips from the Dolphins. Yeah, it's good. It's a good comp, Hort Dog. Sup, Steve? Stoked you're covering this specimen. Hey, man, I appreciate it, Dank. My guy David said he has the best hand usage in the draft. I agree, David. From what I've seen so far, the guys I've broke down, it's not even close. This dude is, his toolbox is so far ahead of everybody else's. Uh, the other guy that I kind of put the film on, David, I was like, oh, like, I know a lot of people in the Eagles community are a little lukewarm on this dude, but I think he's actually a pretty good ball player's verse from Florida State. I think he's actually another one of these guys that's really decent, but I think he's going to go ahead of where we we're going to have range to pick. Even if we were to trade up, I think the the jump we would have to go to go get him is just way too far. I think he's the pass rusher in the draft, but that injury would stop me from drafting in round one or two. Not me. Not if we're talking about the 20, Chin, just because the the rate of missing in the 20s anyways. Like, I'd rather I'll, – I'll accept the miss on an injury. If you got the evaluation right in terms of the player's abilities, but just the health wasn't there, I can accept that. But when you miss on the evaluation, when you take a Marcus Smith, that's hard to, you know, that, that one's a little harder, right? I uh, don't think he'll fall to us, but if he's anywhere near, we should trade up. What up, T-Will? How you doing, buddy? Dank said he's a big fan of Jonah Ellis. His speed off the snap is scary. Twitchy. Uh, how old is La uh, Latu? Uh, it's like twenty three. It'll be twenty four in like, like New Year's. Is it like New Year's Day is his birthday? I think something like that. Yeah, no, New Year's Eve. Yeah, it'll be twenty four on New Year's Eve. T will good point. Yeah, twenty three. Yeah, yeah. See, everybody's kind of chiming in with the date of birth. <laughs> JT, even with your help, I still don't know how to say that man's first name. <laughs> I'm gonna have to uh, listen to it on the um, the voice translator a few times. They don't really say his first name very often on, on the commentary. So it's like, uh, I don't even want to try. <laughs> I don't even want to try. Uh, Leggett or Corley would be the guy I would want day two. I like both of those players. A lot of yak <laughs> there. Anyone else with the surname Fashanu? I've heard it pronounced. I've heard it all pronounced. It Fashana, Fash Anu. That's a great name and player. I remember Musha. Yeah, the Moose, bro. Musin Muhammad was a dog, man. Yes, <laughs> Dank's comment. Musin Muhammad was a dog. His son is in the in this draft. I didn't know that. I didn't actually know that, Dank. That's interesting. How the heck did I miss that? <laughs> yeah, Moose was crazy, bro. Which prospect do you see that would improve the Eagles the most? Uh, I think if you got a day one starter at corner, Lonely B. I think you got improvement there. I think if you got a guy that's going to be your future at edge as an edge player, but is going to contribute immediately to the rotation. When I say immediately to the rotation, I don't mean like seven snaps a game. I mean upwards of 15 snaps a game and be productive. I think that's going to help your team. I think that's going to improve you a little bit. Um, I think that linebacker is a position that could get involved. It's not a, it's not a lock. You know, you, they do have white, they do have Nicobe Dean. So there is an uphill battle for a young player to get in there. But if a dude is just clearly better, I think they're going to have a hard time keeping them off the field just because they're just not, I don't think they're as solidified as people think at linebacker. But I do, you know, I, I like the, the darts they've thrown at the board this season there. Um, I would say linebacker, you can get an impact guy there. If you want to play some 12 personnel, um, depending on how you want to utilize 12 personnel. So obviously looking at what we've, what we've signed recently, you know, you do have some fits in the run game, some physicality there, but if you want to play more through the passing game, 
You probably could use a guy that could come in and, and do that in a day two situation and be a potential future replacement for Goddard down the line. Um, let's see some other areas. Right guard, if you want to improve that run game, Lonely B. Um, depends on how they view the situation, right? I mean, I personally want to see Steen get a chance, but if they're not comfortable with that and they got a guy that they think is a difference maker on day one, can step in and play right guard and be productive and elevate this offensive line and elevate this run game in particular with Saquon, I mean, that's definitely an area where you could get better. Uh, safety, I, I kind of like what we got at safety, but, I mean, if you can get another difference maker in here, safeties get injured, man. Linebackers and safeties get injured. It's a contact sport, and they get they take a lot of contact. Yeah, I remember them, Dan. I, I live here in North Carolina, man. <laughs> What's up, showing off? How you doing, buddy? Uh, Gates, if Dijon is the pick, do you think he is better suited for outside or nickel? Uh, I would play him outside. I wouldn't play him as a tall nickel, especially as a first round pick. Now, if they want to play him as a strong side safety, I could see that fly parks. Um, I don't know if they give the position the value there in the first round. I mean, maybe they do. You know, we all say that until they do it. You know what I mean? But I think they would view him as a boundary corner if they're drafting him in the first round. I do think he's got some flexibility. I think, you know, you could move him all around. You know, if they needed him to to go in and carry in the slot, he could do it. I mean, I don't think you're going to move him from the outside corner to safety without there being like some kind of injury that necessitates that move. But I definitely think that depending on the matchup, you know, you got a guy like Cooper Cup going inside. You know what I'm saying? You might move a guy like this. You know, you might move Cooper DeGene there. He's got a little bit of movement skill. He's a little bit more physical. Can You know, you know what I'm saying? Has the adequate height and size profile. I can see them trying to, you know, kind of follow them around a little bit and do things like that to make sure that that's a better fit there. But I don't think that would be where he permanently would play in terms of the Eagles. Now the teams might view him that way. They might view him as a tall nickel. They might view him as a safety. They might view him as a, you know, boundary side corner. What's weird is I'm not hearing any Eagles drafting a linebacker early buzz anymore. Uh, day two, I think in the second round, I would say it's probably in play, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough, man. It's, it's tough because like they just haven't done it. Now, it would be interesting to see if the board fell a certain way and if they just fell in love with like a guy like Peyton Wilson. I know we've been talking about Edge, and I think Edge, you know, Edrin is a really good fit for the Eagles. I do. But if Peyton Wilson, you know, I'm an NC State guy. I watched the guy play his entire career there. He's an interesting guy. But, I mean, if you're going to draft that linebacker in the first round, whether it's Edrin, whether it's Peyton, that guy better be like a Brian Erlacher for your system. He better be a dare. I'm not saying he's got to be those players. He's got to be those players for your system. You know, uh, Derek Brooks for the, you know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers back in the day, you know, Erlacher for the Bears back in the day. He's got to be that kind of fit, right? Luke Keekley in Carolina. Like, he's he's got to be that kind of impact, I think, if you're going to take him in the first round. If he's just going to be a really, really solid, good player, then I think, you know, you try to get those guys on day two if you can. That's the tough part, man, is we're never really very early in the first round. Like, the few times we've been there is, like, when we got guys like – uh uh, when we drafted, what's his name? Uh, big boy Dickerson, Landon Dickerson. Like, you know, that was a, a fairly early second round pick. You know, we don't normally get a lot of those earlier, you know, to mid second round picks. We're normally picking in the back. If Xavier uh, Leggett is there at 50 or 53, we should definitely consider him. We've had enough misses on the injury or evaluation. We need some hits. Laugh out loud. <sighs> By that token, though, should they have drafted Devontae Smith, even though he didn't come in with injuries, he was an injury concern coming into the league as an undersized player. Should they have drafted Landon Dickerson, who is a way, way larger injury concern? I mean, the dude had four surgeries in five years coming out of Alabama and Florida State. And dude missed significant playing time, but he was a really good player, right? We've also scared off of dudes we should have never been scared off of, like DK Metcalf, who also had a neck injury. We got scared of taking him, and we took J.J., we had Paris Campbell on that board too, and DK was still the better player than both of them. I, I, it's both ways there, man. Gate, another name to remember is John McCartan, 6'5, 250, edge outside linebacker out of Oregon State for three years. He was coached by uh, Tim Tibbesier. Sorry, I don't know how to say his name, man. Former position coach for TJ Watt, Andrew Van Ginkle, and Zach Bond, Wisconsin guy. McCartan was used in a similar role that Vic likes to use his edge rushers and surprisingly reliable. It seems big sleeper for a late round pick or UDFA. Shit. Hang on guys. Sorry. <laughs> My screen started going crazy and opening up everything.
Oh, Dang said I was wrong. <laughs> Moose Bomb at the third went back to school and he'll be there in the 2025 draft. Exactly. Gate lot two is, is such a beast. You can't pass that up. Yeah. I mean, nothing's guaranteed in the NFL in terms of health, man. I mean, a dude can come in with a really sketchy injury history and never really have injuries in the league. A dude can come in with a clean bill of health and looks the part physically fit. You think he's going to be perfect. And he takes the wrong step and ends up getting, you know, just a bad foot injury and is never, never quite the same player. I mean, sometimes it's really the luck of the draw, man. Lonely B said, uh, have you seen Ricky Purcell's film? He has an amazing one-handed catch. He looks to have a great hands. Uh, a little bit. I've watched a little bit of his. I haven't gone extensively into his just because most of the receivers, I know Ricky Purcell is a second round kind of third. He's in that same valuation that we were talking about earlier uh, with Corley. And then, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit. You know, we talked about a few different receivers in this stream. He's definitely in that same range, you know, with those guys. Uh, it depends, man. It depends him. And there's the other young man from um, Alabama. I don't have all their names written down in front of me guys, but there's, there's like four or five guys in that range that are, um, it, it's going to be interesting to see what the Eagles do in terms of like, do you take 50 or 53 and trade backwards? Do they take 50 and 53 and move forward? You know what I mean? Like something tells me like if they don't move forward in the first round, they're either, you know what I'm saying? Like something's going to happen. I, I just know how he's not just going to stay still. He's going to come forward or backwards at some point. He just, he doesn't like to just stay still. Um, that's been his MO for a while now drafting. So we'll have to see you guys. I mean, he's, he's an interesting dude to me, how he is when it comes to these drafts and the way that he kind of approaches things. Uh, trying to think who are some of the other guys I was breaking down. So I did do a mock draft. We're going to do that tomorrow, guys. I did a mock draft. Okay. I got everything down for you guys. We're going to go over that mock draft. Um, I will tell you right from the jump, guys, so, so some uh, prep here. I did my best to try to move backwards in this draft just to see where I could get corners from. And I got burnt two out of three times on trying to move backwards. So I moved backwards thinking like, okay, I'm either going to get Cooper DeJean or I'm going to get, you know, McKinsley, just McKinstry, just how this draft board normally works. And both times I did that, both guys got selected. So then I'm like, okay, well, I'll try to get in possession to get like TJ Tampa or something. And I didn't want to take TJ Tampa in the first round. So then he kept getting picked up early, early in the second round. Like it definitely caught me a couple of times on the cornerbacks until I got it to eventually kind of like line up to like being a, a, an interesting conversation around the draft. Uh, I did post on Twitter for you guys that follow me on Twitter. I did tell you guys a little bit about this draft is that uh, I, I won't spoil it for everybody here, but you guys on Twitter know what I'm talking about. I did draft an interior defensive lineman. Um, he came screaming down the board, which was kind of expected. We all knew he was going to drop down the boards and I had an eternal struggle. I had an internal struggle with whether or not you take this type of player because in terms of his play on the field, this is the best run defender in this entire draft class. And I, I, I took him. <laughs> I had a hard time passing him up. I just thought to myself like, Hey, I don't, you know, I'm not in the room. I'm not meeting with him personally, but I do believe that if a person is truly remorseful, they are truly taking, you know, being accountable for their actions. And this does feel like this is something that is a one-time event with the individual. I believe in second chances for those young men. Um, I can't say that that's factual statements I'm making. I don't know the player. I'm not in there talking to the coaches. I'm not talking to any, you know what I mean? So it's hard to say that, but man, when I saw this person come down the board, guys, I'm like a lot of you, we're going to do that tomorrow. Guys, I'm going to go over that draft board that I have. Uh, I'm going to talk about the way that I have some of these guys valued. I'm going to tell you like what I'm looking for. Um, two of my drafts, I got Neil in the third one that I, I'm actually going to show you tomorrow. I, I don't think I was able to actually get Neil in. I think he got taken a little earlier than I was expecting. Like it definitely throws you some curveballs, man. Like uh, I was trying to get a good feel for like where they were valuing these dudes. It's still, I don't think it's still locked in correctly. Even though we're like a week outside of the draft, it's still not quite locked in correctly. They got dudes going entirely too high. They got dudes that are available entirely too late. It's, there's no way they're going to be available at the picks they're, that they're allowing them to be taken. Now I tried to mess around with the different settings on there. They didn't do crap. So tomorrow guys, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to go over that draft board. I'm surprised Purcell is still alive. His quarterback threw nothing, but hospital passes to him and he still caught the ball. Yeah, you can get a guy definitely hurt. <laughs> you can get those stretcher throws. There's no doubt about that. All right, guys, I appreciate y'all so much. I just wanted to come on and talk for a few minutes. I had been watching Latu's film this whole morning, and I was like, I got to go live and talk about this dude for a little bit because um, what I saw there, man, whew, we'll do it one more time, guys. We'll pull it up. I mean, what I saw on this guy's film, this is a guy worth taking a chance on. Uh, it's hard to find these type of players, man. If he's there at 22, I'm probably taking a chance on this young man. Here he is in coverage. Hands up. Boom. 
Doesn't show him dropping in the flat, but you see the anticipation. You see the eyes. All right, bending and bending the edge and flattening out. He's going to be bottom of your screen. Here he goes. He's going to flatten. Boom. He's going to be top side this time. He's going to do the same thing. We're going to see him bend and flatten out here. Here he goes. Look at that hand usage, by the way. This was just a complete mismatch for Coastal Carolina's line. Tight ends on this dude, I mean, it was laughable. Putting tight ends on this guy's laughable. He's over here at the bottom. And boom. Flattens out. It was a really good flatten out there. Inside pass rush using his hands is the thing that really kind of caught my attention. Watch that outside hand, guys. He's going to come over arm club here. It's almost like kind of like quasi swim. It's an overhand club. Boom. Free. There he goes. I, I think this guy's toolbox is the best in this draft class. I don't even think it's close, guys. I think he's got the most impressive toolbox in this entire draft class from the edge players. It's the guy I would go personally, guys. If he's there, it's going to be hard to turn that one down, guys. It's going to definitely be hard to turn that one down. Hey, Lonely B, I appreciate that, buddy. So just wanted to say I love your content. Thank you. Hey, man, I appreciate you, buddy. Hey, what's up, Drew? He said, what's up, Gate? Just stopping through. Hope all is well. It's going well, man. Going well. Uh, still, still sleepless nights with this child, man. Waking me up at 12 and 4 o'clock in the morning <laughs> for those feedings. But uh, all things considered, doing pretty well, man. I can't complain. All right, guys. I appreciate y'all so much. If you missed the live stream or you came in late, um, I think I gave like three different points in here, guys. I actually ran the film <laughs> on this guy. So if you missed that part, go back. You can watch it, guys. I ran the film on there. Um, let me know your thoughts, guys. Let me know your thoughts after the video. Tell me what you think about this player. It's risky. There's a risk to this pick. There's no doubt about it. Um, I still think that they're looking at filling that right guard, right, right tackle role edge player. I think they'll take an interior defense alignment, like a Byron Murphy, if that's the way the board falls. And I think they're looking at corners. I do. I think they're, the interest is genuine in, in Cooper DeJean. I think the interest is genuine in Kool-Aid McKinstry. I think the interest is genuine with those players, right? I still think they got guys in day two and, you know, they're looking at, um, I, you know, I don't think it's all or nothing in the first round. I do think that they have backup plans there. I do think receiver is kind of a sneaky one to watch, depending on how everything pans out. It's just hard to predict this board, guys. I think this year it's a little harder to predict what's going to happen from about pick 18 backwards. It's, it's going to be really, you know, what, what goes on in those first 16 picks is going to be real interesting, man. I know there's a V strong argument for tackle, but I want either Latu or Deshaun. Dejean. All right, guys. I appreciate y'all so much. And uh, I'll see y'all tomorrow. We're going to go over. We're going to do a mock draft tomorrow, guys. I'm going to tell you what I did in the mock draft. After tomorrow, we'll do a com uh, on Wednesday, we'll do a community-based mock draft. So we'll do a mock draft from start to finish on here. All right, guys, I appreciate y'all. Peace.